The Holy Gospel for the fifth Sunday after Epiphany is from the Gospel according to Mark, the first chapter, beginning at the 29th verse. And at once on leaving the synagogue, Jesus went with James and John straight to the house of Simon and Andrew. Now Simon's mother-in-law was in bed and feverish, and at once they told him about her. He went into her, took her by the hand, and helped her up. And the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening after sunset, they brought to him all who were sick and those who were possessed by devils. The whole town came crowding round the door, and he cured many who were sick with diseases of one kind or another. He also drove out many devils, but he would not allow them to speak, because they knew who he was. The Gospel of the Lord. People of God, I'm glad you're gathering today. Gathering differently than usual, gathering virtually, gathering in your homes, gathering perhaps in a, in a worship space, but, but following health directives. I'm glad you're gathering today. I want to center with you on the word. It's the word that we have shared in good times and in hard times. We've shared it in times of war, in times of peace, in times of growth and prosperity, and in times of uh, uncertainty. So walk with me today into the word that holds us. If you're at home today, I'd invite you to open your Bibles to the beginning of the Gospel according to Mark, where our text is found this morning, and dwell with me in that so deep, so beautiful Gospel. Let us pray. May these words of my mouth and the meditations and thoughts of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength, our rock, and our redeemer. Amen. First, a word about the gospel according to Mark among the gospels. You know, we love the Good Samaritan story and the story of the prodigal son, there from the gospel according to Luke. We love getting directions about how to be church and how to walk each day. The Gospel of Matthew is where we go for, for that. Matthew's Gospel called the Gospel of the Church, often enough. In Matthew, we have clear directions about how to pray, about love, about how to be church, even about step-by-step step, how to handle conflict. But Mark's Gospel is different. Mark's Gospel is often a puzzling narrative filled with unanswered questions. For example, as you make your way through Mark, Frequently, Jesus will heal someone and then will say, whatever you do, don't tell anyone. Don't tell anyone. So why is someone who is starting a movement rejecting that kind of advertising? For 2,000 years, theologians have been wondering why he said that. Various solutions have been suggested, but, but we don't know. We're not quite sure what God is up to in the story. Mark doesn't tell us. Maybe that's why I'm so drawn to the narrative, because in fact, our lives are much like that, aren't they? We're not always so sure what God is up to in the events of our lives or in the events of our world either. <clears throat> Maybe that's particularly the case in this past year as we walk through this pandemic. So I'd invite you to turn to Mark chapter 1 and walk your way through it. <clears throat> Now, each of the Gospels, each of the three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, usually call the Synoptic Gospels, they have a kind of a similar order to them, different in details, but a similar sort of order. Basically, each of the Gospels tells the story of one year of Jesus' ministry in Galilee. That takes two-thirds of the Gospel, probably. And then it tells the one week of Jesus in Jerusalem, from Palm Sunday through Good Friday to Easter Day. So... A year in Galilee, a week in Jerusalem. All three of those follow that order. Each of them, though, starts the gospel with a prologue to give you a hint about what you're going to be looking for, what's going to be happening. And when you look at the beginning of the gospel according to Mark, you might be surprised, first of all, by what's not there. There are no shepherds in the field watching their flocks by night. There are no magi following a star. No, nope, none of that. Mark starts his prologue really, really quickly. He starts 
It's only 12 verses long. And eight of them are dedicated to introducing us to John the Baptist. In verse 9, Jesus comes in, and this is his entire introduction. It was at this time that Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized in the Jordan by John. That's it. No birth story. Jesus arrives a grown man, and he comes from Nazareth, which, unlike Bethlehem, is a place of no particular renown. Uh, in fact, there was a saying in, noted in other Gospels that <clears throat> can anything good come out of Nazareth? Because it's just a simple place, right? Jesus comes into the Gospel of Matthew, the Gospel of Mark, rather, simply. Jesus in blue jeans, if you like. He meets John the Baptist and is baptized. And as the water runs down his body, he hears the voice of God affirming that he is God's son and God is pleased with him. That immediately following the baptism in verse 12, the spirit drives him into the desert. Notice the spirit doesn't suggest he go to the desert. It doesn't even guide him to go to the desert. The spirit drives him into the desert where Jesus remains for 40 days and is put to the test by the Satan. <clears throat> now, when you look at that in, verse, in chapter 1, you might expect to hear a dialogue between the Satan and Jesus about uh, turn these stones into bread or throw yourself off the temple and, and God will bear you up. No, in the Gospel of Mark, none of that. Mark doesn't say. What does the Satan say? Mark doesn't say. What's it for? Mark doesn't say. Just that he was driven into this lonely place and was tested for 40 days. And afterward, the angels served him. The Greek word for served here is diakoneo, the word behind our word deacon. And it means that the angels ministered to him so that he could continue the journey. So ends the prologue, very quickly. <clears throat> then Jesus went into Galilee and proclaim the message. This begins the 11 chapters or so of, uh, of the description of the ministry in Galilee. He begins by saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is close at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. So what does the kingdom of God look like? <clears throat> there were all sorts of possible meanings. Many groups in Jesus' time were putting forward a way to the kingdom of God, a way to God's new world. The zealots called for an armed rebellion against the Roman overlords to bring in a new world. They were asking to storm the capital. The Essenes called the people to withdraw from the world into a colony and follow the scriptures together and wait for the God's kingdom. The Pharisees and Sadducees each had a plan for meeting the kingdom of God for God's new world that was breaking in. What does the kingdom of God Jesus proclaims look like? Mark doesn't say. In Galilee, right at the outset, though, he does show one thing about how the new world, this kingdom of God Jesus had proclaimed was coming. Jesus immediately, in the Gospel of Mark, gathers together a community. Through this community, he gathers. This is how the kingdom of God will be met. Now, the community he gathers isn't the community you might have expected. He gathers fishermen, four of them. He goes up to two fishermen who are working with nets and Simon and Andrew, and he says, follow me. You know what they do? They drop their nets, and they follow him. Why do they follow him? Mark doesn't say. And then he sees two other fishermen, James and John calls them to follow him. They immediately leave their fishing to follow Jesus. Why do they follow him? Mark doesn't say. I wonder, as they followed after Jesus, I wonder if they wondered, too, these four fishermen, what Jesus was really announcing. What was he building? Were they the beginning of an army? Or were they the beginning of a cloister? Or something else? Our gospel text for today takes place then during one day in the life of this church of four fishermen. <clears throat> the Sabbath day begins with the church of four fishermen following Jesus into Capernaum, where Jesus preaches in a synagogue. Mark says that the people marveled at his words. What did he teach? Mark doesn't say. Just that the people hung on his words. 
Then after the preaching, Jesus meets a person we would describe as sick in body and mind and soul, and Jesus heals him. So the early church, the church of four fishermen, are beginning to know what the kingdom of God was going to be about. It would be about teaching, and it was going to be about bringing healing to the broken and rejected. On leaving the synagogue, Jesus and his church of four fishermen went straight to the home of Simon's mother-in-law. She was in bed with a fever. See, the church had said, Jesus, is there something you can do for Simon's mother-in-law? Does that sound familiar? The church of Jesus prays for each other. And yes, they didn't just pray. They went along the road with Jesus. They went on the road with Jesus to where the need was. Now listen to what happens. Mark, in so few words, tells it so beautifully. Jesus went into her, took her by the hand, lifted her up, and the fever left her. It was a ministry of presence. He went to see her. It was a ministry of touch. He took her by the hand. It was a ministry of healing. He lifted her up. This little church of four fishermen was learning that this kingdom of God, this church, was not about leading an uprising against the Romans, no. Nor was it withdrawing from the world into a cloister. It would be about dwelling deeply in the world. In the world, It would be about drawing near to people. It would be about lifting people up. It would be about healing and blessing. Finally, the moment that the house closes, so simply with his four words, he could almost miss it. Then she served them. The word in Greek for served, same one was used for the angels in the temptation time. Diakoneo. The angels ministered to Jesus. The angels ministered to Jesus in the 40 days of temptation. Here, Simon's mother-in-law ministers to Jesus and to the church. She did angels' work. She ministered to Jesus and this little church of four fishermen. Now four fishermen and one mother-in-law. The healed had become the healer. Those lifted up become those who lift up others. Finally, the day closes for the little church like this. The text reads, That evening after sunset, they brought to him all who were sick and those who were possessed by devils. The whole town came crowding around the door, and he cured many who were sick with diseases of one kind or another. He also drove out many devils, but he would not allow them to speak because they knew who he was. People were gathering around Jesus. He healed many, but not all. Why not? Cast out many devils, but not all. Why not? Mark doesn't say. And then Jesus tells them not to tell anyone about the healing. Why are they told to tell no one? Mark doesn't say. I think this gospel story already speaks to us. It speaks to each of us, somewhere in our lives, without any comment from me. I think if not today, we'll speak to you later, to speak to us later as we walk. But I want to share one thing where the story takes me in this time in my life. I'm struck today by the unpredictable journey of this church of four fishermen. I'm so struck by the questions they were obliged to carry along. Why did Jesus tell those healed not to tell anyone? They don't know. Why did only some get healed? They don't know. Why did Jesus choose simple down-to-earth fishermen to lead his church? They don't know that either. The question for the journey of the people of faith, these questions are all over the place, aren't they? But like the four fishermen, we find ourselves following Jesus down the road every day. Barbara Brown Taylor in Gospel Medicine says this, On Sunday mornings, a great division takes place among American people. Some go to church, and most stay home. She adds, the ones who stay home just see no particular value in the church on, on Sunday morning. It looks like an hour, a Sunday, that they could have done something better with something more constructive. They could have cut the grass. 
They could have, you know, painted the basement. But for those of us who gather, she says, we know something else. She says, this is how we learn how we fit. This is how we locate ourselves between the past and the future, between our hopes and our fears, between the earth and the stars. This is how we learn who we are and what we're supposed to be doing by coming together to sing and to pray, to be silent, to be still, by peering into the darkness together and telling each other what we will see when we do. That's how important this following Jesus is for us, isn't it? So I leave you the story of these four first fishermen walking with Jesus, walking each day learning how to be church, walking each day with unexpected blessings and unanswerable questions. But I think if you ask them about what walking with Jesus meant, they would say everything. Everything as do we. Amen.